Chapter 15 Smith in the City This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Aaron Andrade. Chapter 15 Stirring Times on the Common. The first thing to do, said Smith, is to ascertain that such a place as Clapham Common really exists. One has heard of it, of course, but has its existence ever been proved? I think not. Having accomplished that, we must then try to find out how to get to it. I should say at a venture that it would necessitate a sea voyage. On the other hand, Comrade Waller, who is a native of the spot, seems to find no difficulty in rolling to the office every morning. Therefore, you follow me, Jackson? It must be in England." In that case, we will take a taxi-meter cab and go out into the unknown, hand in hand, trusting to luck. "'I expect you could get there by tram,' said Mike. Smith suppressed a slight shudder. "'I fear, Comrade Jackson,' he said, "'that the old noblesse oblige traditions of the Smiths would not allow me to do that. No, we will stroll gently, after a light lunch, to Trafalgar Square and hail a taxi.' "'Beastly expensive!' But with what an object can any expenditure be called excessive which enables us to hear Comrade Waller being mordant and ironical at the other end? It's a rum business, said Mike. I hope the Dickens he won't mix us up in it. We should look frightful fools. I may possibly say a few words, said Smith carelessly, if the spirit moves me. Who am I that I should deny people a simple pleasure? Mike looked alarmed. Look here, he said. I say, if you are going to play the goat, for goodness sake, don't go lugging me into it. I've got heaps of troubles without that. Smith waved the objection aside. You, he said, will be one of the large and, I hope, interested audience. Nothing more. But it is quite possible that the spirit may not move me. I may not feel inspired to speak. I am not one of those who love speaking for speaking's sake. If I have no message for the many-headed, I shall remain silent. "'Then I hope the Dickens you won't have,' said Mike. "'Of all things he hated most being conspicuous before a crowd, "'except at cricket, which was a different thing, "'and he had an uneasy feeling that Smith would rather like it than otherwise. "'We shall see,' said Smith absently. "'Of course, if in the vein, I might do something big in the way of oratory. "'I am a plain, blunt man, but I feel convinced that, given the opportunity, "'I should haul up my slacks to some effect. "'But, well... We shall see. We shall see. And with this ghastly state of doubt, Mike had to be content. It was with feelings of apprehension that he accompanied Smith from the flat to Trafalgar Square in search of a cab which should convey them to Clapham Common. They were to meet Mr. Waller at the edge of the common nearest the old town of Clapham. On the journey down, Smith was inclined to be debonair. Mike, on the other hand, was silent and apprehensive. He knew enough of Smith to know that, if half an opportunity were offered him, he would extract entertainment from this affair after his own fashion, and then the odds were that he himself would be dragged into it. Perhaps, his scalp bristled at the mere idea, he would even be let in for a speech. This grisly thought had hardly come into his head when Smith spoke. "'I'm not half sure,' he said thoughtfully. "'I shan't call on you for a speech, Comrade Jackson.' "'Look here, Smith,' began Mike agitatedly. "'I don't know. I think your solid, incisive style would rather go down with the masses. However, we shall see. We shall see.' Mike reached the common in a state of nervous collapse. Mr. Waller was waiting for them by the railings near the pond. The apostle of the Revolution was clad soberly in black except for a tie of vivid crimson— His eyes shone with a light of enthusiasm vastly different from the mild glow of amiability which they exhibited for six days in every week. The man was transformed. "'Here you are,' he said. "'Here you are. Excellent. You are in good time. Comrades Wotherspoon and Preble have already begun to speak. I shall commence now that you have come. This is the way, over by these trees.' They made their way towards a small clump of trees, near which a fair-sized crowd had already begun to collect. Evidently listening to the speakers was one of Clapham's fashionable Sunday amusements. 
Mr. Waller talked and gesticulated incessantly as he walked. Smith's demeanor was perhaps a shade patronizing, but he displayed interest. Mike proceeded to the meeting with the air of an about-to-be-washed dog. He was loathing the whole business with a heartiness worthy of a better cause. Somehow he felt he was going to be made to look a fool before the afternoon was over, but he registered a vow that nothing should drag him on to the small platform which had been erected for the benefit of the speaker. As they drew nearer, the voices of comrades Wetherspoon and Preble became more audible. They had been audible all the time, very much so, but now they grew in volume. Comrade Wetherspoon was a tall, thin man with side whiskers and a high voice. He scattered his H's as a fountain its sprays in a strong wind. He was very earnest. Comrade Preble was earnest, too, perhaps even more so than Comrade Wetherspoon. He was handicapped to some extent, however, by not having a palate. This gave to his profoundest thoughts a certain weirdness, as if they had been uttered in an unknown tongue. The crowd was thickest round his platform. The grown-up section plainly regarded him as a comedian, pure and simple, and roared with happy laughter when he urged them to march upon Park Lane and loot the same without mercy or scruple. The children were more doubtful. Several had broken down and been led away in tears. When Mr. Waller got up to speak on platform number three, his audience consisted at first only of Smith, Mike, and a fox terrier. Gradually, however, he attracted others. After wavering for a while, the crowd finally decided that he was worth hearing. He had a method of his own. Lacking the natural gifts which marked Comrade Preble out as an entertainer, he made up for this by his activity. Where his colleagues stood comparatively still, Mr. Waller behaved with the vivacity generally supposed to belong only to peas on shovels and cats on hot bricks. He crouched to denounce the House of Lords. He bounded from side to side while dissecting the methods of the plutocrats. During an impassioned onslaught on the monarchical system, he stood on one leg and hopped. This was more the sort of thing the crowd had come to see. Comrade Wetherspoon found himself deserted, and even Comrade Preble's shortcomings in the way of pallet were insufficient to keep his flock together, the entire strength of the audience gathered in front of the third platform. Mike, separated from Smith by the movement of the crowd, listened with a growing depression. That feeling which attacks a sensitive person sometimes at the theater when somebody is making himself ridiculous on the stage, the illogical feeling that it is he and not the actor who is floundering, had come over him in a wave. He liked Mr. Waller, and it made his gorge rise to see him exposing himself to the jeers of a crowd. The fact that Mr. Waller himself did not know that they were jeers, but mistook them for applause, made it no better. Mike felt vaguely furious. His indignation began to take a more personal shape when the speaker, branching off from the main subject of socialism, began to touch on temperance. There was no particular reason why Mr. Waller should have introduced the subject of temperance, except that he happened to be an enthusiast. He linked it on to his remarks on socialism by attributing the lethargy of the masses to their fondness for alcohol, and the crowd, which had been inclined rather to pat itself on the back during the assaults on rank and property, finding itself assailed in its turn, resented it. They were there to listen to speakers telling them that they were the finest fellows on earth, not pointing out their little failings to them. The feeling of the meeting became hostile. The jeers grew more frequent and less good-tempered. "'Comrade Waller means well,' said a voice in Mike's ear. "'But if he shoots it at them like this much more, there'll be a bit of an imbroglio.' "'Look here, Smith,' said Mike quickly. "'Can't we stop him? These chaps are getting fed up, and they look bargies enough to do anything. They'll be going for him or something soon.' "'How can we switch off the flow? I don't see.' The man is wound up. He means to get it off his chest if it snows. I feel we are by way of being in the soup once more, Comrade Jackson. We can only sit tight and look on. The crowd was becoming more threatening every minute. A group of young men of the loafer class who stood near Mike were especially fertile in comment. Smith's eyes were on the speaker, but Mike was watching this group closely. Suddenly he saw one of them, a thick-set youth wearing a cloth cap and no collar, stoop. When he rose again, there was a stone in his hand. 
The sight acted on Mike like a spur. Vague rage against nobody in particular had been simmering in him for half an hour. Now it concentrated itself on the cloth-capped one. Mr. Waller paused momentarily before renewing his harangue. The man in the cloth cap raised his hand. There was a swirl in the crowd, and the first thing that Smith saw as he turned was Mike seizing the would-be marksman round the neck and hurling him to the ground after the manner of a forward at football tackling an opponent during a line-out from touch. There is one thing which will always distract the attention of a crowd from any speaker, and that is a dispute between two of its units. Mr. Waller's views on temperance were forgotten in an instant. The audience surged round Mike and his opponent. The latter had scrambled to his feet now and was looking round for his assailant. "'That's him, Bill!' cried eager voices, indicating Mike. "'He's the bloke what it you, Bill!' said others, more precise in detail. Bill advanced on Mike in a sidelong, crab-like manner. "'Who are you, I should like to know?' said Bill. Mike, rightly holding that this was merely a rhetorical question and that Bill had no real thirst for information as to his family history, made no reply. Or rather, the reply he made was not verbal. He waited till his questioner was within range, and then hit him in the eye. A reply far more satisfactory, if not to Bill himself, at any rate to the interested onlookers, than any flow of words. A contented sigh went up from the crowd. Their Sunday afternoon was going to be spent just as they considered Sunday afternoon should be spent. "'Give us your coat,' said Smith briskly, "'and try to get it over quick. Don't go in for any fancy sparring. Switch it on, all you know, from the start. I'll keep a thoughtful eye open to see that none of his friends and relations join in.' Outwardly, Smith was unruffled, but inwardly he was not feeling so composed. An ordinary turn-up before an impartial crowd which could be relied upon to preserve the etiquette of these matters was one thing. As regards the actual little dispute with the cloth-capped bill, he felt that he could rely on Mike to handle it satisfactorily. But there was no knowing how long the crowd would be content to remain mere spectators. There was no doubt which way its sympathies lay. Bill, now stripped of his coat and sketching out in a hoarse voice a scenario of what he intended to do, Knocking Mike down and stamping him into the mud was one of the milder feats he promised to perform for the entertainment of an indulgent audience, was plainly the popular favorite. Smith, though he did not show it, was more than a little apprehensive. Mike, having more to occupy his mind in the immediate present, was not anxious concerning the future. He had the great advantage over Smith of having lost his temper. Smith could look on the situation as a whole and count the risks and possibilities. Mike could only see Bill shuffling towards him with his head down and shoulders bunched. "'Go it, Bill!' said someone. "'Ply up! The arsenal!' urged a voice on the outskirts of the crowd. A chorus of encouragement from kind friends in front. "'Step up, Bill!' And Bill stepped. End of chapter 15